how is everybody? We're good. Good, I'm good too. Uh, Brian, as you know, is in Texas and he asked me, oh, three or four weeks ago if I would teach tonight. I reluctantly said yes. <laughs> I love all y'all, but you do scare me. Anyway, uh, with the help of the Lord, and should be Terry, okay? Next week, we're going to get together with family and friends, and we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving. And I'm so thankful to live in a country where we set aside a day to celebrate Thanksgiving and to be thankful for all of our blessings that God has, has bestowed upon us. Thanking God for all his gifts is vitally important in our Christian walk. In Psalms 136, verse 1, it declares, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithfulness never ends. It endures forever. When I say thankfulness, I want to also insert there, steadfast, never ending, never quits. His love endures forever. And you know what? If you can't think of, think of anything else to thank God for, we can thank Him for His faithful love, can't we? And because He is good to us. Because He is. When toddlers are really, really small and they're starting to walk and they're starting to talk, we teach them two words. Anybody think of what they might be? Mom and Daddy. Mom and Daddy. But when we hand them something, we say, say, thank you, give them a piece of candy, thank you, give them a book, thank you, and they say thank you. But as they grow older, we need to teach them the value of saying thank you. And we need to teach them what it means to truly be thankful. Otherwise, we grow up and we just say thank you and it doesn't mean anything, does it? But you need to have a heartfelt thank you. Uh, our thank you should be heartfelt with a grateful attitude. Now, I made up a definition for grateful because I looked up Mr. Webster like uh, Bill does every Sunday in Sunday school class. He looks up Mr. Webster uh, on different words. And I like what Mr. Webster said, but I also like what the, I think it's called New Collegiate Dictionary. There's several out there. And I like them all, but I made up my own, okay? So <laughs> grat gratitude is the quality of being thankful for what we have and readiness to show appreciation for and return a kindness. Brenda invites me over for lunch. I want to reciprocate, don't I? And I want to invite her for lunch. Linda gives me a present. I want to give her a present. So uh, we, we want to show appreciation for what others have done for us. So we try to return that kindness. Uh, the more grateful we are, the more we can see to be grateful for. Because we begin to look for things to be thankful for. Uh, being grateful and seeing things to be thankful for becomes a good habit. Do you know some people don't have a habit of saying thank you? You do something for them or you say something kind to them and they just go on in their way. Now, a thank you goes a long way with me. Mm -hmm. if, if I do something for you and you don't say thank you and truly mean it, it's not likely I'm going to do it again for a little while anyway, unless the Lord tells me to. <laughs> but a thank you goes a long way for me. So I can, can you only imagine how a thank you to God it goes a long way for him too. Tim Keller said, gratitude is what you feel. Thanksgiving is what you do. Gratitude is a feeling. Thanksgiving is something you do. Tonight we're going to talk about the power of gratitude. I never even thought about it being powerful, but being uh, grateful and having an attitude of gratitude is very powerful. I did quite a bit of research on, on the gratefulness and having a, an attitude of gratitude, and there is a lot of information out there. I didn't realize there was, 
But I created a list of benefits of being grateful. And I mainly went with two people. One was Lisa Apello. I get an email from her once a week or so. And uh, she's a Christian writer and blogger. She did, she did a whole article on being grateful. And the other one, I'm not going to try to pronounce this man's name. The first one I can get, first name is Cheetah. <laughs> and his last name is O-K-O-R-O-A-F-O-R. -O -O He's the general super, superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Nigeria. That's why I didn't pronounce his name. But living a life with a grat attitude of gratitude is a powerful source and the benefits are enormous. I created this list from, from those two blogs of things that gratitude is and what it does for us. Gratitude glorifies God. That's the first one on your, or the second one on your, on your uh, questions there. Gratitude glorifies God. God. Scripture tells us in Isaiah 43, 7 that we were created for his glory. Giving God the credit due him and as we honor him with a grateful heart, we bring him glory. To glorify God is to recognize him for who he really is. He's our creator. He's our provider. He created this earth. He's our healer. He's what we need at the time we need it, isn't he? And then uh, Psalm 63, 3 says, My lips will praise you. Thank God and tell others of his greatness. Tell God, but tell others also how great God is. He alone is worthy of our thanksgiving. God is glorified as we tell him and others of his greatness. He is worthy of all our thanksgiving. When you offer praise and thanksgiving to God, you glorify him. Psalm 50, 23 in the New King James Version says, Whoever offers praise glorifies me. Give him praise, for he alone is worthy of our praise. Remember, in Isaiah 43, 7, it says he created us for his glory. So when we praise him and thank him and tell others about his greatness, we're giving him glory. The second benefit of gratitude is gratitude helps us see God. Gratitude helps us see God. Have you ever felt like God wasn't near? Did you ever think he may have forgotten about you? I have. And if we're all honest, we probably have all felt that way somewhat. Uh, you might feel like he's not working for me. He has just totally forgotten about the situation that I'm in. We might feel like uh, he's just totally forgotten. But if we stop and start thanking him for what he has done for us in the past, what he's doing for us right now, and thank him for what he's going to do for us in the future, it opens our eyes to see more and more things that he has done for us. We begin to see more of his character. We can see his hand in our lives, and we can see the doors open and doors closed and the benefit of those. You ever had a door closed? One that you prayed for and, and truly wanted God to open but to close that door? I remember one time uh, Larry and I were uh, on the verge of really needing a new car. And uh, back then you didn't get on the internet and search for one. You got out the newspaper and you read through the newspaper looking for uh, deals on cars at car dealers places. And Larry found one he thought we might could afford and would need, would meet our needs. And so we made an appointment with the car dealer and went there. Nothing worked out. We had to get up and leave because it didn't work out. It was a beautiful car, but it just did not work out for us. 
few weeks later, he was looking through the newspaper again, and he found another car dealer. And, well, here we go again. I hate going to the car dealer, <laughs> especially with my husband, because he would chew people down, and that was so embarrassing to me. <laughs> I just, oh, I just hated it. But he always took me so I could give him my opinion of what, if I liked the car or I didn't like the car. Anyway, a few weeks later, he saw this car in the newspaper and we made an appointment to go look at it. And we did, and he test drove it, and I rode along, and it was really nice. But I thought, well, you blew it the last time. We probably won't get this one either. But we went in and made, the, made a deal. But we got within $50. And Larry got up and walked out. <laughs> Over fifty dollars. You talk about really being embarrassed. I was embarrassed. But we drove home, and when we pulled into the garage, I heard the phone ringing. So I ran in the house and I answered the phone. And they said they need to speak to Mr. Barnett. And I said okay. And so I handed the phone to him, and it was the car dealer, Mr. Barnett. I've been talking to our financial guy, and uh, I think we can make a deal with you. And they came up, to, or went down to $50. And he said, well, Larry said, well, okay, but I want to do a set of tires put on it. <laughs> <laughs> I was so thankful I wasn't in that man's office. When he <laughs> and the man said, well, let me talk to the financial guy. So he came back and said, Mr. Barnett, you drive a hard bargain, but we're going to do it. We're going to put a new set of tires. Because we, he never would buy a brand new car. He wanted one that was barely used, like, what do they call them? Program cards, cars, or? Dealer's cars. It's what the dealers drive for a little bit, demos or something. Anyway, so we got ready, went to the car dealer, went in, talked to the guy, and got ready to sign the papers. And I don't know who we're dealing. And he said, uh, I Larry said, I really think you need to pay the taxes and put tags on it. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the man said, all right, we'll do it. And God closed the one door, but he opened another door. We had to be thankful for the door that he closed because he opened the door for a much better deal. He got new tires put on the car, he got the taxes paid, and he got the license plates paid for. They said he drove a hard bargain, but it worked because he sets his he prays about prayed about it before we ever left. And this is the price that God put on his heart and it worked out. He stuck to the guns what God told him to do. We must thank him for what he did not do and what he did do. Thanking God for all his gifts, good and what we might deem to be not so good, helps us see God and his handiwork. We can go back and look in the past and see how God has worked throughout our lives. Number three, gratitude puts us in God's will. Gratitude puts us in God's will. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us, Be thankful in all things, in all circumstances. For this is the will of God. This is God's will. To give thanks. And it's for those who belong to Christ Jesus. To be in God's will, we have to be thankful in every circumstance of our life. We must be diligent to give thanks on good days as well as the bad days. Even in the worst situations, we can find good if we look for it. But you have to look for it. We can look for a lesson that needs to be learned. All kinds of things we can look for. But we look for, the, for things to be thankful for. During those times, we can be thankful that the situation was not as bad as what it could be. We can look for lessons to be learned in the bad situations, and we must be thankful in all things because it's God's will. It puts us in God's will when we're thankful. 
And that was found in, did I say, 1 Thessalonians 5.18? Yeah, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Number four, gratitude brings encouragement. In 1 Samuel 17, verses 36 through 54, we read of the story of David and Goliath. David told Saul that he had killed lions and he killed bears, and that God would save him from the God had saved him from the lions and the bears. He told Saul that he could kill the heathen Philistine, and God would save him. David acknowledged that God had saved him from the lions and the bears, and gave him that gave David encouragement. You know, if I kill a lion. And I kill a bear. I kill this giant. Because he's, he's talking ugly to God's people. And it also encouraged Saul. Because at first, Saul said, No, you're just a young man. You can't go out there and fight this giant. But then David told him, I killed lions and I killed bears because God helped me. And that encouraged Saul. He said, Okay, you go. But may the Lord be with you. Looking at and telling others about and crediting God for past victories encourages us to trust God for our next victory. You looking forward to your next victory? Think about, think about what he's done in the past for you. Number five, gratitude builds faith. Giving thanks for what God has done increases our faith, as well as the faith of others. Did you ever feel encouraged and, and your faith is built by listening to the testimony of other people? Absolutely. You remember 50, 60 years ago, I don't remember 60 years ago, but you know. Uh, you remember when we used to have testimony services? I do, and your faith is built when you hear. Remember, Granny Warren used to stand up and say what God had done for her, and Sister Freeman would just praise the Lord and tell what God had done for her, and it built our faith. And the same thing happens today. You get together with your friends, and you talk about what God has done for you, and they talk about what God's done for them, and it builds your faith. If he did it for them, he'll do it for me. So it builds our faith. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is a faith builder. It helps build our faith. The more you hear it and the more you tell others, the more your faith increases. For the thanks, for the thanks giver and for the hearer. So it not only encourages the one giving thanks, but it encourages the hearer as well. Gratitude, I love this one, brings multiplication. John 6, verses 5 through 13, tells us the story of when Jesus fed the 5,000. The people were hungry. They came to listen to Jesus teach. There was no food to feed the crowd. And Jesus asked Andrew, what are we going to do? And Andrew said, we don't have the money to go buy the food we need to feed this many people. And it was just, it was 5,000 men sitting on the grass. And that wasn't counting the women and the children. I don't know why they didn't count women and children. They were important too. But they counted the men. <laughs> they counted the men. There were 5,000 of them. How are we going to feed these people? And Andrew says he found a little boy there who had five barley loaves and two fishes. Jesus had the people, about 5,000 men, sit in the grassy area. Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks. And then he started passing the loaves of bread out to the disciples and the fish out. Five loaves of bread, two fishes. And he passed them out to the disciples after he gave thanks. And then they fed all the men and the women and the children. And how many baskets were left over? Twelve baskets were left over. God took that little bitty bit and multiplied it and multiplied it and multiplied it. 
all because Jesus gave thanks for it. God brought multiplication after Jesus gave thanks for the little bit they had. He'll do the same multiplication for you, for us, in our lives if we have, if we live a life of gratitude. Can you think of a time when he multiplied for you? I can't. Many, many, many times. I was thinking about it today, and one in particular time, uh, my husband's job, the business closed up. He had no job. And uh, we went nine months with him looking for a job. Nine months when you got two babies is a long time when you have to buy. Well, we didn't buy diapers because we used the cloth kind. Uh, but you had food, you had formula to buy, and you had bills to pay, and you had tithes to pay, and you're living on a, on a uh, unemployment check. Mm -hmm. And it's, it doesn't even come near what you were making because he was driving the truck. He was, I mean, uh, wasn't driving the truck at that time. He was the station manager for truck lines, making pretty good money. And then all of a sudden, that was chopped off. But one night in a youth rally in Arkansas, we were listening to the, to the district. Well, back then, they were called PYPA leaders. Now they're called uh, DYDs, District Youth Directors. And he preached on the widow and the barrel she had that was never empty. It was never empty. She did what she was told to do. Elijah told her, go make me a cake. She said, well, all I've got is this little bitty bit. He said, go make me a cake. And you know, her barrel was never empty. That happened long about September of that year when Larry lost his job. And uh, somebody paid our way to come up here to come home for Christmas to visit with family. Brother McKinley caught Larry out of the audience one Sunday night. And he said, Larry, your barrel is never going to be empty. And thank God it was never empty that whole nine months. That was a long nine months, but our cabinets were never there, never ever. We always paid our tithes first, we always paid our bills first, and then what was left over, we bought food with it. I remember one week, it was all said and done, we had $13 left, and I had my formula, and food for Becky and Larry and me. But you know what? God made a way. And I'll always be grateful to him for what he did for us. He multiplied. He multiplied that little bit that was in our cabinet. And I just knew, I just knew, every time I went out to the mailbox, there was going to be a check for $1,000. That's how God was going to meet my need. He didn't. He didn't meet the need that way. But he met the need because he multiplied the little bit we had, and we were thankful for what he did do. Can you think of a time when God multiplied for you? Absolutely all of us can. And then the story about the widow and her son and the barrel that was never empty is found in 1 Kings chapter 17. And number seven, gratitude turns healing into wholeness. Now I looked up the definition of whole. It means complete, restored, free of defect or impairment, physically sound, free of disease or deformity, mentally or emotionally sound. Now the story of the 10 lepers, I know all y'all know that story, is found in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. As Jesus entered the village, he met 10 lepers that were standing off to the side. And they shouted, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus saw them and said, Go show yourselves to the priest. As they went, they were cleansed. When one of the men, who was a Samaritan, who I understand the Jews did not like Samaritans, saw that he was healed, he returned to Jesus, and with a loud voice he glorified God. He fell on his face at the feet of Jesus and gave thanks because the Lord had healed him. And Jesus said to him, Were there not ten people that I healed? Where are the other nine? 
were they found, were there not found who returned to give glory, there, shoot, I can't read, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except that one foreigner? Arise, Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Now then, with that definition I read about being whole, I believe the leper was made completely whole. Not only was he cleansed of leprosy, but his mind was healed. I think he was healed spiritually. I think he was made whole emotionally. Because that's what God does for us when we are thankful for what he's done for us. Thankful and the man was made whole. I, I just think that's wonderful. And then number eight, gratitude brings down the glory of God. I love this one too. Second Chronicles chapter five talks about the ark when it's being brought back into the temple. Solomon had just finished his work on the temple and they were ready to move the ark of the covenant into the temple. Solomon brought in all the gifts his father David had dedicated, all the silver and the gold. Then the ark was brought into the temple. Solomon summoned the elders and all the leaders, the heads of the tribes. They were bringing the ark of the, Co the Lord's covenant to the temple from Zion. When the elders of Israel arrived, the Levites picked up the ark and all the sacred items in it, and King Solomon and Solomon and the entire community of Israel sacrificed many sheep, goats, and cattle. Then the priest carried the Ark of the Lord's Covenant into the sanctuary of the temple, into the most holy place. All the priests purified themselves, whether they were on duty or not on duty that day. The Levites were, and who were magicians, music, they played musical instruments. And their sons and brothers were clothed in fine linen robes. They played cymbals and lyres and harps. They were joined by 120 pri priests who played trumpets. The magician, music, music, the people that played the instruments, musicians and singers performed together in unison to praise and give thanks to the Lord in unison. They were all playing and singing together and they sang, God is good. He is, his faithful love endures forever. God is good. His faithful and love, faith and faithful love endures forever. As they played their instruments and sang, a thick cloud began to fall in the temple. And it said that the priest could not even stand, couldn't stand, couldn't minister anymore because of the glorious presence of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? When we come into God's presence with an attitude of gratitude, sing his praises and tell of his greatness and awesomeness, his glory comes down. We must focus on gratitude every day. Every single day, think about it. Uh, my son, son Matthew, on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, wrote, happiness doesn't suddenly come when you finally get what you didn't have. Rather, it comes when you appreciate the things you have already, you already have. Let me read that again. Happiness doesn't suddenly come when you finally get what you didn't have. Rather, it comes when you appreciate what you already have. This world would have us believe that what we need is more and more and more and more. And reality is, more does not satisfy us. Whatever it is, it's just not going to satisfy us. Uh, we think if we get a new car, I'll be happy then. If I get a new house, I'll be happy then. If I get married, I'll be happy. If I have a baby, I'll be but uh, uh, anyway, if I if I retire, I'll get I'll be happy. 
But we can't wait till these things happen. We need to be thankful now for what we already have. Uh, appreciate God for what he has done, how he's blessed us. We must live a life of gratitude. Once we start truly thanking God, we'll start seeing more and more to be thankful for. So how do we get started being thankful? Well, I Googled that too. <laughs> and every site that I went to talked about making a gratitude journal. And I don't have a journal to pass out to anybody. But I think if you were on the back of your questions, if you would start. Now some of the sites said list one through seven and write down everything you're thankful for. And the next day, write down seven more. Another place said, start with three. Write down three things you're thankful for. Next day, write down three more things. I think if you just write down what you are thankful for every day, add a little bit more of what you are thankful for, you'll start looking for things to be thankful for. And guess what? You'll find them pretty easily, too. So I think that's what we need to do is start a... a Gratitude journal. I started one last year. I started writing down everything I was thankful for. Some days I had to really think, and that's that's not good, but I did. Uh, but then it got easier every day. Every day it got a little easier to to thank him and praise him for who he is and what he's done. Uh, anybody ever heard of Zig Ziglar? Yeah. I have, and I, I uh, love his books. I love listening to his little speeches. And we've got one tonight, and I want to, Jason to play it. He says in this video, the healthiest of all human emotions is gratitude. Keep that in mind as you're watching. Art Mays is my executive assistant. Got a phone call from a lady in Birmingham, Alabama. At the end of the conversation, she said, Z, she said, I believe this woman thinks she's got an impossible problem, but I believe you can solve that problem her, with her in just a few minutes if you will spend that time with her. I said, well, Laurie, tell her to meet me backstage. I'll get there about 10 minutes early. My schedule was such that was about all I had. Well, I got there, and I was on uh, backstage behind the curtain on one side. She spotted me from the other side, and as she walked across the stage, I have never seen as much anger in a human being in my life as I saw in her. She almost started crying when she saw me. She said, oh, I'm just so glad to see you. I got this horrible job. I hate it. I hate everything about it. I hate everybody down there. I mean, uh, you're talking about negative nails. She was it. She said, can you help me? Now, understand I've only got about 10 minutes. So I looked at her, and uh, one thing I have learned, I don't do counseling, but I talk with a lot of people who do, in psychology, psychiatry, and the ministry. And they tell me that everybody who comes to you with a problem are not necessarily looking for a solution. I couldn't understand that for a long time. Why do they bring you a problem if they don't want to solve it? Well, I can tell you why. They want to tell you about it, 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 and if you foul up the deal and solve the problem, they can't tell you again, you again, they want the attention that goes with the problem. And every company just about it has that kind of an individual. They want the attention that goes with griping and, uh, and complaining. Well, I looked at the lady, and it wasn't unkindly, but firmly I said to her, yes, and you know, ma'am, I'm afraid your problem is about to get worse. She said, what do you mean? I said, I believe they're going to fire you. <laughs> She was stunned. I couldn't have stunned her more if I'd hit her in the face with a bucket of ice water. She said, fire me? Why on earth would they fire me? Inflection in her voice clearly said, they're the bad guys. I'm the good guy. Why don't they fire them and keep me? Have you ever noticed that people who are the problem never recognize that they are? They're in complete denial. They think denial is just a river in Egypt. Why don't they fire me? I said, ma'am, I don't believe there's a company in America big enough to contain this much poison in one small spot. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when somebody is about to lose something they've been complaining about, whether it's a car, a home, a mate, a job, or whatever, 
when all of a sudden it appears they're going to lose them, it takes on brand new value. <laughs> she looked at me and said, well, what can I do? I said, do you really want to know? She said, yes, I do. That's the reason I came to see you. I came looking for help, but you sure haven't been any help so far. I said, well, ma'am, I've got an idea. And I will absolutely guarantee you, it positively, definitely, absolutely will work if you will just do it. She said, I'll try anything within reason. I said, okay, when you get home tonight, all of your household tasks are complete. It's bedtime. Get off in a room right by yourself. Get a sheet of paper out, and at the top of it, right, I like my job because she interrupted me. She said, that'll be easy. I don't like nothing about that job. I don't like nothing about those people down there. And I said, well, just as a matter of curiosity, do you work there for benevolent reasons, or do they pay you for working there? She said, well, i got to confess, they pay me. And I said, and you don't like to be paid. Oh, she said, yes, I do. I said, okay, tell you what you do. Open your notebook right now. We'll start our list of the things you like about your job. They pay you for working there, and you do like it, don't you? She said, absolutely. But she just stood there. I said, no, open your notebook now, and we'll get uh, busy on the list. She just stood there. I said, ma'am, let me, let me tell you what my experience in life has been. I've discovered that in 100% of the cases, no exception, people who won't take Step number one, never take step number two. You see, she had come to me with an impossible dream. Her dream was that nice Mr. Ziegler was going to solve all of her problems, and she would live happily ever after. <laughs> but folks, I got news for you. I can't solve her problems. I can't solve your problems. But I will give you some steps that I absolutely, definitely, and positively will work for you, as it worked eventually for her. I said, well, ma'am, let me tell you something. Unless you're willing to take step number one right now, it's been nice talking with you. She angrily opened her notebook. Before we got through, there were 22 things she liked about her job. Not only did, not only did they pay her for working there, but they paid her above average. She had three weeks vacation with pay. She had a retirement program. She was in on profit sharing. She had health insurance, life insurance, and accident insurance. She lived less than 10 minutes from home. She was in on management decisions. The company sent her to three seminars a year to be paid for. She had her own private office and parking place. 22 things that she liked about her job. Now I said, ma'am, when you get home tonight, everything is finished. Get off in a room right by yourself. Close the doors. Change one word from I like my job to I love my job. Get in front of that mirror, and folks, I cannot say this strongly enough, but I'm going to try. The eyes are the windows of the soul. Look yourself in the eye, and with excitement and enthusiasm, say, I love my job because they pay me for working there. I love my job because they pay me above average for working there. I love my job because they have a wonderful insurance program. I love my job before every one of the statements. You will sleep better that night. You see, there's something hidden in what I'm saying to you now. When she says, I like my job, she's really saying, I'm grateful for my job. And of all of the emotions we can have, according to Hans Selye, the number one stress specialist in America, the healthiest of all human emotions is gratitude. I said, you go down that list. I like my job. I love my job, rather. That is a way of gratitude. You'll sleep better the first night. Tomorrow morning, when you get up, Get back in front of the mirror just before you go to work. Get back in front of the mirror and repeat the process again with excitement and enthusiasm. I love my job because, and take the list with you. Because the reality is, you see, you will have started to change from a fault finder to a good finder. Some people do really find fault like there's a reward for it. They really do. Take the list with you, and you will be able to add to that list absolutely guaranteed. Do this every morning and every night, and you will have an astonishing recovery from this advanced case of stinking thinking. Now, I didn't say that to her, but I'm saying it to you. That's what it was. It was an advanced case of stinking thinking. Well, six weeks later, I was back in Birmingham, Alabama. I was doing a follow-up sales seminar. Now, the lady was not in sales, but she'd been listening to my tapes. She'd been listening to Automobile University, 
and see and discover that everybody sells. Everybody who will ever hear this is in selling. Whether you're a skilled teacher, a civil service worker, a military personnel, an executive secretary, it doesn't make any difference. What you do, you sell every day of your life. There she was on the, at the sales seminar, seated on the front row, grinning so white she could have eaten a banana sideways. I'm telling you, you're talking about somebody who was excited, and she was turned on. I said, well, how you doing? She grinned even more broadly and said, Mr. Ziegler, I'm doing wonderfully well, and thank you for asking. She said, you cannot believe how much those people down there have changed. <laughs> I got to lay it on the line, folks. You're not going to change anybody else till you change you. Everything really does begin with you. Now, you see, the unfortunate thing, this lady had been raised in a very negative environment. First, her parents had told her this could never amount to anything. They said, you know, you're always late. You're always sloppy. Why can't you be like your brother or your sister or whatever? When she got married, her husband had continued it. And so her self-talk had become completely negative. Everything that she said about herself was negative. I, you know, like Dad said, I never amounted to anything. Or like my husband said, I can't do anything right. But when she started changing the input, then some radical change. Yeah. Any good? Have you ever met somebody negative? Yeah. They never found anything good with anything. I mean, nothing. Some people grow up in that environment, and then they become negative. But you know what? That lady changed by being thankful. We can change. If we're negative, we can change. It's a habit that you get into when you're negative and always finding fault. It's also a habit when you're always thanking God and looking for the good. It becomes a positive life, doesn't it? And that's what we want, is to live in a positive life. Uh, I encourage you to... to, to Tonight, when you get home or in the morning, write on the back of your answer sheet about uh, things you're thankful for, and it'll help you become more thankful. And uh, the secret to a good life is seeing the good in life. And that's what we need to do is see the good in life and be thankful for it.